good to be here. We're going to be in a couple places. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 is our main text. We're also going to be in Acts chapter 20. Um, and I've titled the message this morning, Resolution 2024. Um, can you believe that we are only 10 days away from the 1st of February? Already. It just I was talking to my friend Scott this morning that came down with from our church. It, it just seems like just yesterday already that we were celebrating the year 2024, and here we are. January is almost over in 10 days. Um, and really what happens at the first of the year, I know we're about three weeks in, but I think this message is still, is still good to hear because what happens in the new, the new year of every year, we all make resolutions, don't we? I guess the new name for resolutions is goals. I think that's probably smarter uh, because we all set resolutions. We all set goals for the new year, which are good. Um, and those could be anything from working out more um, to dieting to traveling more. That would be the one that I would, I would like to have a resolution for, to travel more. Um, just about anything that, they, that you think will better your lives. And here's one. January 1st, I'm going to start Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to read the entire Bible. And they, we do really good through Genesis and Exodus, but we get to Leviticus, what happens? We skip it, right? Um, but it, some, some even say, well, you know, I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit, quit drinking. Those are all good things. However, most resolutions, if we look at the resolutions, if we look at goals that we set for ourselves every year, it's focused more on the physical and not the spiritual. So what I'd like to do this morning is to challenge us to have a new resolution this year. We can go from January 21st to January 21st. That's fine. Um, a resolution means this. It's a firm decision to do or not to do something. And so resolutions or goals in and of themselves are not bad. They're good. They, they can be exciting. However, the resolution that I believe the Lord is wanting the church, the church, to focus more on this year is intimacy with Jesus. See, all of the ministries that God has placed before us, they're all good. The prison ministry and what you guys are doing in your community, that's all good stuff. It really is. But listen... And I, and I tell our people all the time, if we're doing ministry without intimacy with Jesus, then we're just doing it in our own strength. And in our own strength, what happens? If we do ministry in our own strength, we get burned out. We have a tendency to quit when things don't turn out the way that we had expected, when they don't meet our expectations. We get irritated when we're not appreciated like we feel we should be. Ever been there? I know I have been. See, I really believe that the Lord would have us really get intimate with him this year. Get back to relying on Jesus and get back to having fellowship with him. Not that we're not, but let's do it more. I know our church this year, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a few more times of corporate prayer. I think that's important. We're even, gonna, uh, we're even looking at maybe doing a February fast church-wide, as well as even more, a few more nights of worship. Listen, I think it's important to be involved in the community. We are, you guys are. And it's important to get outside of the walls of the church, right, and shine the light of Jesus in the community that God has placed before us. However, more importantly than any of that is, is to have intimacy with Jesus. Because, listen, intimacy with Jesus changes everything, doesn't it? It, cha it literally changes everything. See, I truly believe that any church who gets back to intimacy with Jesus, God will use greatly in the community in which they're called to serve. However, if we're just going through the motions, because we can't, can't we? I know I can. We go through the emotions, doing things just to do things. All we get is tired and burned out. Feel like that weight gets heavier. See, that's what the church in Ephesus did, was doing. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we're just going to read the first five verses. It says this, to the, church, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. 
and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary, verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In this passage, the Lord is pointing out an issue in our church, in the church, that I believe all of us needs to address in our own life in order to avoid losing this intimacy with Jesus. It's like a warning for them then, but it's also a warning for us today, isn't it? So in this passage, the Lord gives us a warning and ingredients for a healthy and vibrant church. He, he also tells us how a church can be doing good things and still be ineffective for him. In verse 5, notice it says, or else I will remove your lampstand from its place. Which basically is saying, I'm going to take away the very lifeblood that keeps your church alive. I'm going to take away the power. I'm going to remove my presence from the church and your life. Listen, this is the reason churches dry up. Like you probably know of churches, I know I do, know of churches that were vibrant and exciting 20 years ago. But today, that same church isn't even around. It's not, even, it's not even going. It's sad. It's not even in operation. And one of the reasons possibly is that they had gotten so busy that they too had left their first love. In other words, they were doing things in their own strength and had totally relied on self versus relying on Jesus. Like, like they had gotten away from praying about things. Instead, they would just do them because in their minds, it was a good idea. And I know I have a lot of people will come to me and say, hey, Pastor Lance, what do you think about this? It's a good idea. But I always say, well, is it God's idea? Because there's a lot of people that have a lot of great ideas. But we have to pray. We have to spend time with Jesus saying, Lord, I know this is a good idea, but is it your idea? And listen, it's easy to get here, isn't it? It's easy. It's easy for a church to get here. It's easy for an individual to get here that we can get so busy, so distracted, especially in the day and age in which we live. We are, so, we are busy people, aren't we? We can get so distracted. I'm not saying that, that we're in this place right now, but I believe the Lord is wanting all of us to take this letter seriously. Because listen, I have moments like this. There's been seasons of my life where I have been like this and I need to come back. I need to come back to this, this time. And I know in our own church, we, we're busy. We're doing stuff in our community. And I thought it was just appropriate for the Lord to call us back and say, listen, it's great that you guys are out there doing stuff, but hey, don't forget me in the midst of it. So let's look at what the church in Ephesus was doing because they were doing some good things. Notice in verse 2, the Lord says, I know. In other words, Jesus is saying, I see, I, I, I'm watching you, church in Ephesus, and I know what you're doing. And more importantly, listen, he knows our motives behind what we're doing. And he looks, he looks at that as well. Listen, I say this all the time at home, motives matter to God. Like, like why am I doing what I'm doing? I have to ask myself that all the time. Lord, why, why am I doing this? Lance, why am I doing this? Am I doing it with a pure heart for Jesus or am I just doing it because this is what I do? Motives matter to God. And then he says, he says, I know. And then he lists things that they were doing. And listen, what they were doing were good things. It's not like they were doing anything bad. It says that the Lord sees their works and their labor, which tells us that they were busy doing things, doing stuff, doing ministry. They had multiple things going on. It wasn't just that they were working, but that they were laboring in their work. In other words, they were working really hard. Man, they were rolling their sleeves up. They were working really hard. They had committees. They had meetings. They probably had some counseling and holding VBSs. Perhaps they had a building project. And anything else you could think of, they were busy working and busy laboring. But it also says that they had patient endurance. And listen, Jesus knew this and he could relate to it. See, listen, Jesus patiently endured evil as he walked on this earth. And he now sees his church walking in the same way. Again, a good thing. Jesus is encouraged that the church in Ephesus is held fast to sound doctrine and continued in their faith regardless of their circumstances. 
Because listen, we think we live, live in a tough time. They lived in a tougher time. They were pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's something to be said for, for patient endurance, endurance to, to persevere. It also says that they hated evil. Listen, they could not tolerate sin in their midst. In fact, in Paul's last words to the uh, Ephesian elders, he said this in Acts chapter 20. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20 real quick. We're going to look at uh, five verses, 27 and 32. And he's saying this to the, to the elders in the church in Ephesus. He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not, separating, or not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an, an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now you can go back to Revelation chapter 2. And listen, this is exactly what happened and really still happens today. And there were, and, and there were really, there were really a, a few ways in which they recognized and resisted these false teachers. Number one, they rejected their way of life. Why? Because they were speaking th of things that the Bible spoke against. Notice in verse 27 of Acts chapter 20, it says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. In, in other words, Paul went line by line and verse by verse, he gave them the whole counsel of God of what they had in that day. Paul went through the entire Bible and so they knew what the Bible said about certain things. It also says in verse 2 of Revelation chapter 2, another way is they, they, they tested them as well. And because they tested them, that, that also tells us that the church in Ephesus also believed in true teaching. Notice in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 2, it says, Those who say they are apostles and are not, because they had been through the Bible. Paul took them through the entire Bible. They heard the truth. They could recognize the false when they heard it. Listen, it reminds me of, of Secret Service. See, Secret Service not only guards the president, but they also deal with counterfeit money. And here's what they do. If you're in Secret Service, you're going to handle real stuff all day long. They're going to give you real hundreds. You're going to feel real 20s. All, all the bills, you're going to feel real stuff, real stuff. So when a fake, when you feel a fake, you're going to know it's fake and you're going to set it to the side. Why? Because you've been dealing with the true stuff all the time. Same way with us. If we are in God's word all the time, having this intimacy with Jesus, when we hear something fake and phony, we're going to be able to set it to the side knowing there's something not right with that. That makes sense? See, the church in Ephesus was a church that loved the sound doctrine. They loved the truth. They, they, listen, they would have been the church to host conferences on expository preaching and systematic theology. And Jesus is pleased with how the Ephesians loved sound doctrine. And you know, so do we here at Calvary Chapel, don't we? We love sound doctrine at Calvary Chapel. That's why we go through the Bible line by line and verse by verse. I always say it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And that's true. It does. We don't pick and choose our topics. We go through it all. And as Jesus was pleased with, with the church in Ephesus regarding this, listen, he's also pleased with us. He wants us to, to love sound doctrine. He wants us to hunger and thirst after his word. He wants us to. He's pleased about that. You know, in our church back home, Calvary Chapel, Smoky Mountains, we just finished uh, a fa our phase one discipleship class. It was 16 weeks. It was very intensive. We tell people, listen, if you want to come to this, be, just get prepared. We, we need some commitment here. Um, and we just finished it. And I was so encouraged by the participation and eagerness of those who came. I couldn't believe it. Just, they just blew me away how many people came out. And they were there for 16 weeks. And we gave a lot of homework out. And they were there prepared every week. In fact, they didn't want to end it. It was crazy. I was so encouraged by that because they really, listen, they really want to learn and know what, what's true. They want to dive deep into God's word. 
And then this past weekend, we, we, uh, we hosted an end times prophecy conference because, listen, people are hungry and they really want to know what the Bible says about these things, especially now. They want to know what, is, what are we to look forward to? What is going to happen? And so people are hungry and thirsty regarding what God says about not just those things, but all things. Because, listen, there is so much false in our world today. We have to be so careful with who we listen to these days. They'll sound so good. They've got a lot of charisma. But, man, there's so much phony baloney out there. We've got to be careful. But people at Calvary Chapel, no matter where you go in Calvary Chapel, they're hungry for the truth for the most part. You guys really want to know God's word. That's one reason, listen, why I love the Calvary Chapel movement. I I grew up, I grew up out west in Southern California. That's pretty much all I know is Calvary Chapel. I love it because people are just hungry for God's word. See, listen, we at Calvary Chapel, for the most part, are a word-saturated church, aren't we? When you say that we're a word-saturated church, it's just not a bad thing. However, like the church in Ephesus, listen, our greatest strength can become our greatest weakness. See, Jesus, he was pleased with how the church loved sound doctrine and purity. He was pleased with that, but was discouraged with their love. Look at verse 4. Actually, we're going to pick up verse 2. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Listen, it's never a good thing to hear from the Lord. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Like, that's not something you want to hear from the Lord, but you know what? I've heard that from the Lord before. The Lord's busted me. When I needed to be busted. Has he you? Yeah. It's good. It just, it just shows that we're his kid. So, listen, they had, they had like nine things they were doing. They were good things, or six things they were doing that are really good things. Hey, church in Ephesus, you're doing great in this. You're doing great in that. Yes, you love sound doctrine. Yes, you've got patience. Yes, you're, you, you want to hear the truth. Yes, you test those who say they're the apostles, but are not. But, but... Man, you've left your first love. Several good things, but one indictment. See, listen, on the outside, the church in Ephesus, they look good. They were busy, and everything this church was doing was amazing. And on top of all the good things they were doing, they had an up-and-coming pastor discipled by Paul himself named Timothy. That was the church in Ephesus. See, in that day, every other church in the region wanted to be this church. This was the church that every church looked to. But they had one problem within the church. They they did all of these things right, but they had the one problem in the church. They did it all, Jesus said, without me. They did all these things without me. And listen, Paul, he was chained to a Roman soldier as he wrote this letter to the church, uh, as he wrote, Uh, the book of Ephesians. Paul Paul spent a lot of time dealing with this church and sharing with this church. And they did all these things without the Lord. Jesus says they didn't love me. See, what he's saying is you guys, even though you're doing great things, you have gotten off track. You have forgotten why you're even doing what you're doing. You've forgotten your first love. See, what Jesus is saying here is that, listen, listen, Every relationship in life is based upon love. Now, listen, we don't know what happened with the church in Ephesus, but we do know this, that you never hear any mention of the church of Ephesus after this. It it dissolves into the logs, to the annals of history. Now, we don't know if they rejected this or accepted it, but here's what I believe Jesus is getting at here. Listen, Don't let your activity overshadow your affection for Jesus. Don't let your activity, don't get get too busy. Don't let the busyness of serving overshadow the intimacy with Jesus. It's so easy to do. 
I have to remind myself of this all the time. I get, listen, I, I could be a workaholic. And I have to really watch myself that I don't get too busy doing ministry, which is good things. It's good to do ministry. But don't, don't let that get, don't get so busy in that that you forget Jesus along the way. We would say, don't get in the habit of, of looking at your Christianity as a duty that you have to fulfill and not a devotion to God. Don't think more of it as a duty, like I have to do this, I have to do that. No, it's more of a devotion to God. You guys with me? It's a devotion to God. See, for all of the positives in the life of this church, they had abandoned the love they had at the beginning of their walk with Jesus. This is a great danger in the church today. See, it isn't though that they had forgotten about God for they were zealously pursuing the truth. They were busy doing great things in ministry for the, for the Lord. They were engaged in ministry, but here's the problem. The problem was, listen, they were, so, they were t- so busy doing for the Lord that they didn't have time for the Lord. They were too busy doing for the Lord that they didn't have time for the Lord. The danger was that they were pursuing the truth apart from a heart saturated with the love of God. And listen, in ministry, that's always a danger. You can, you can be a word-saturated church without love-saturated hearts. There's a danger. And the only way that you can have love-saturated hearts is spending time with Jesus. There is no fast track. There is no substitution. You, you, you have to put in the time with Jesus. There's no shortcuts. So you can't love the people. Listen, you cannot love people until you have intimacy with Jesus. Like I said, intimacy with Jesus changes everything. I always, I always, if, if I find myself praying for the love of people, I feel like there's something missing with me and Jesus. Because if I'm spending time with Jesus, oh, I'm going to love the people. Intimacy with Jesus changes everything. See, I have found in my life that in those times where I've been bitter, or angry, or not willing to forgive, where I've held on to things longer than I should, it's because my relationship with Jesus in that moment was not where it should be. It's not where it should be. I, I have neglected that time with the Lord, and because of that, now it starts, it starts uh, you know, affecting other parts of my life towards others. So the question for us is this, how is our intimacy with Jesus right now. We had a conference we, last week, and we had our conference, but this last weekend, since we live in Pigeon Forge and right by Dollywood and the Dream War Resort, we have a lot of churches say, hey, can we use your building? And so we have a, a, a good buddy of mine, a pastor at an uh, evangelical free church in Georgia, and he, uh, they always come up every year, they rent our building out, and they just did this this week, and they had a couple hundred people come to the conference, and one of the questions was, and they had everybody stand up, and they were hand, handing out um, gift bags. And one of the questions was, this is like 9 o'clock yesterday morning um, as they were wrapping their conference up, is sit down if you haven't read your Bible this morning. And listen, out of a couple hundred people, about 90% sat down. But here's the kicker. I would have had to sit down too. We can get so busy, we can get so distracted that we don't spend time with Jesus. You guys with me? So are you walking closely with Jesus this morning? Are we having communion with him daily, both through his word and in prayer? Do you love other believers? Like you like you like wake up on a Sunday morning like I cannot wait to get to church this morning. I'm just I can't wait to love on the people. Like, is that you? Listen, that's not me always. It is from time to time. I love it. I love the people of our church. But there are times that I feel like I'm walking in mud. It's like, oh, it's like a drudge, isn't it? Do you love other believers? Has any bitterness grown in your heart toward others? Is there someone right now that you know you're at odds with? 
Do you have unresolved anger towards someone, get this, in the church? Is there someone in the church that's just really irritated you? Just kind of really just bothered you? And you're holding on to that. See, these are signs of someone who has lost that intimacy with Jesus. I, I know I've been there. I've been there many times. We, we can all get there. Listen, if we're not careful. And perhaps you're thinking, well, I, I don't have any of that. Like, I, I'm not bitter. I, I'm not angry with others in the church. But listen, what about those outside the walls of the church? Someone at work. Someone at school. See, our love can grow cold very gradually if we aren't careful. Kind of reminds me of a campfire. Anybody go camping here? Is there are a lot of good places to camp around here. Well, up by the Smoky Mountains, people, they camp all the time. And I'm not, honestly, from being from Southern California, I'm not that big of a fan of it. Um, but I have camped once or twice. But, you know, you, people go camping. They, they love having campfires, light, light campfires. What do you do? You, you, you got to gather some sticks. You, you light the sticks on fire. And what's the very next step that you need to, to do to keep the fire burning? When you get the fire going, you need to gather more wood, don't you? Boy, that sounds fun. You got to gather more wood to place in the fire from time to time. Why? Because a fire has a tendency to go out if there isn't anything placed in it to fuel the fire like wood. And the same thing is true with love. Listen, if we do not fan the flame of our love for God, his church, and those in the world, it will cease to burn. See, listen, the Lord has instructed us in, Matthew, in the last chapter of Matthew, the church, to go make disciples to all nations. And if we've lost that intimacy with Jesus, our love for others will grow cold, and we won't want to go share Jesus with others around us. You guys with me? Real quick story, I just popped in my mind, I'm going to share it. I lived in Haiti for two years, and we have an organization called Housetops for Haiti down there. We still go down there once in a while. We actually, from our church, we just sent our first missionary, full-time missionary down there about six, eight months ago. And, uh, and I was down there, I taught at the university, and one of my students, we actually brought up, we hired, and um, I brought him to the States for the very first time, and that was so fun, bringing him to the United States for the very first time. I got tons of stories to tell you about that. Uh, but one of the stories is we, um, I was at a church in Chattanooga, and they had a bit, they had a men's like a men's conference. So I brought him with me, and um, it was cold, probably in the 50s at night. You know, it's September, and we're up in the mountains. And um, and so what do the guys do? They 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 want to start a fire. They have this campfire, the big old fire. There's probably I don't know 50, 60 guys there. They have this big campfire, and um, it's chilly. And I'm looking around, I'm like, well, where's, where's, Seraph, where's Pastor Seraphin at? They're like, well, he's in the trailer. And so I go in there, and, and this boy, he's never seen 54 degrees before in his life. It's as cold as he's ever seen. And he's in his hoodie, and he's in his sleeping bag. I'm like, bro, like, like, everybody's outside, and you come from Haiti. They want to spend time with you. Why are you in here? Come out with us. Okay. He didn't complain about it. He just put his shoes on and had the hoodie. And he goes out there, and he's got his hoodie up, and he's sitting by the campfire, and He's, he's really cool about it. He goes, Pastor Lance, he goes, I got a question for you. I'm like, what's that, Pastor Seraphim? He goes, listen, it's, it's cold out here, right? Yeah, and you guys have a fire. You guys leave the warm, come out, have a fire to get warm. Like, why don't we just go inside? I'm like, well, I'm like, Seraphim, this, like this is like a culture thing. Like, you don't get it, bro. Like, but it was funny. It was, it, was, it was cute. But the love of the Lord it reminds me of a campfire. It will cease to burn. You know, I remember when I first got saved. Man, I, I was so excited to share Jesus. Remember, I, I was on fire. for Anybody heard that term, being on fire for the Lord? Like we're in the Bible Belt. You probably all heard about it. Remember that time? Remember you accept Jesus? All of a sudden, this book is not just black letters on white paper, like, like ooh, this is real stuff. Like, th this is God's word. I remember almost dropping it one, but I was so excited to share my faith. I just, I had an overwhelming just love for people, and I was concerned about people's salvation because God could return any time, and they would be eternally lost. 
And so I have this heart. I, I remember I was 17 years old, and I won't tell you what year it was. Just a few years ago. Um, I was 17 years old. I come to the Lord, and my, my brother-in-law and my sister um, would go down in, in Riverside, California, um, this, this bar called Spanky's, and it, the guy that owned it, they knew him. It was a secular bar. And we would go there and wait outside and just share Jesus with everybody that came out. It was so wonderful. And one time we were there, my brother-in-law was a musician, and uh, they didn't have a band show up, a secular band show up. And they're like, hey, you guys want to put together, you, can you guys play some music? And they're like, yeah, give us like one hour. They went home, got their instruments, and in that bar they're playing Christian music. It was outstanding. But I remember I couldn't wait for Friday nights because we were going to Spanky's to share Jesus with people. I couldn't wait. That was the highlight of my week. And all my friends got saved about the same time, and we would have, like, sleepovers. And instead of doing what we used to do, we'd just, like, pray all night. Isn't that weird? But we loved it. We couldn't get enough of it. Remember those times when you first come to Jesus? Remember what that was like? See, listen, if we do not fan the flame of our love for God, it will grow cold. And so the question becomes, how do we get this back? How do we get that back? Ever wondered that before? Like, I want that back. And I know we don't live by feelings, but boy, those feelings were pretty nice, weren't they? How do we rekindle that love affair that we once had for Jesus in our life? How do we get back to really wanting to share with Jesus? To have that heart, when you see someone that's not saved, to have a heart of compassion for them. How do we get that back? Look at verse 5. It says this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. It says, remember... Therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus gives clear commands to recover that love that's grown cold due to leaving your first love. Notice the first thing, it says to remember. There has to be a remembrance from where you were and where you are. Like, remember what you were like before giving your life to Jesus? Remember that person? I, I, re, I, I vaguely remember, and it was, it was an ugly person. It was ugly. I was filled with anger, and I was filled with hatred, and I was driven to do things that I knew were not good for God, that God didn't want me to do. See, when you remember the things you used to do and where you've come from, it actually causes you to be aware of where you are presently. Or how about this? You give your life to Jesus, you're on fire. Over, over a course of time, that love grows cold, and now here you are today, some years later. And you remember what those times were like, don't you? Let me ask you this question. Was there a time in your life where you used to have passion for Jesus? Is there a time in your life, when you look back, that you had passion for Jesus? Was there a time in your life where you used to be passionate about God? See, it's good for us to remember. Listen, there was times in my life when I first got saved that I would read this book. I would read the Bible like eight to ten hours a day. I couldn't get enough of it. What's happened? What's happened to me? What's happened to us? And if you're, hey, if you have a, that, that passion and that love's not grown cold, man, God bless you. But for those of us that have had this happen, and it happens from time to time, remember what, what, those, what it was like when you had that, when you were passionate for Jesus. It's good for us to remember. Then it says to repent. Repentance means to turn around, to, to do an about face. Any military guys in here or gals in here? An about face. You're walking one way, and then you do an about face. You walk another way. But in order to turn around, we must recognize that we have focused on other things. See, when we focus on other things or someone else, listen, our direction will follow our focus. Our direction will always follow what we're focused on. So the question is, what are we focused on? What, what are we focused on? Have we gotten off track? Have we kind of veered off course ever so slightly? See, when we get distracted with other things, our direction changes. That's why we need to repent. Now think about this. 
Repentance is basically how you're walking. So the question is, where are your feet pointing right now? What direction are you walking? Where, where is your, your feet pointed? And only you can answer this. Are you pointing towards Jesus? Or are you pointing towards the world, the flesh, or sin? Or are you so distracted with what's going on in the world today? Is that your focus? Let me ask it another way. Would you admit that you've lost the love you once had for Christ? Could it be that you're focused on other things such as comfort, money, possessions, or even politics? See, listen, what consumes our attention controls our affection. What consumes our attention controls our affection. When our attention shifts from pointing towards Jesus to other things, that's when we need to repent. And I don't know about you, but I can get distracted. I can kind of veer off because I'm I'm focused on other things. And so often I have to do an about face. I think the reason, honestly, why many have stayed off course is because they keep minimizing and justifying the thing in their life. And they're not wanting to call it for what it is, a sin. Listen, we can justify what we do, can't we? We can make excuses Listen, I'm the best excuse maker for the way, what, I, what I do. We are. We can make excuses. Now listen, repentance is not this. I'm convicted at night. You say, you, you, say, you know, I am never going to do that again. You ever done that? You're like, oh man, I'm never going to do that again. And, and you even say, God, I confess it before you. Please forgive me, Lord. And then the next day you wake up and do it all over again. That's not repentance. That's remorse. That's guilt. Repentance is, I recognize that this is sin. I recognize the way I'm I'm walking is sin, and so I'm going to turn around. I'm going to walk towards Jesus, never to do that again. That's repentance. Not because of what he'll do to me, but because of what I'm doing to a holy God. When we come to that recognition of what we do, how it makes God feel. See, what, here's what true repentance does. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness in our life. It gives us a clear mind, a clear conscience. It takes away the burden of sin in our life and it lets us walk in victory. We then start to live the abundant life Christ promised by repenting. Then the last thing we're told to do is do the first works or repeat. Repeat that that what you were doing when you were passionate for Jesus. So remember those days. Remember what you were doing in that time. Go back and do those things you once did when that passion for God was there. For me, it's spending more time in his word. It's praying not only in my personal life, but with other brothers and sisters. It's sharing with people. It's amazing what just sharing your faith will do to your faith. How it strengthens you. How you get, man, you get energized. When I see people sharing their faith, they get energized. There's something about it. So I've got three points I'm going to give you real quick. I have three main takeaways from this passage this morning. Number one, listen, God knows what you're doing. He sees. He sees your life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He sees it all. Number two, God restores everyone who returns to him. Isn't that good news? I say this this to our body a lot. I can picture, remember when you're about five years old? And I remember when I was about five years old, man, I've been away. You know, my dad had been at work. And I remember him coming to work, coming home. and, And I'd run out to him. I'd run out and meet him in the driveway. And he'd get down on his knees. And he, and I'd just run into his arms. Remember that? I picture that. I picture that's the Lord. When we come back to him, it's like he's on his knees. He's saying, come home. Come back. I love you. And he wraps his arms around you. And then number three, once we remember and repent, God will still use us. You know, part of my story is I was saved at 17 years old. And then I joined the military and I backslid for 17 years. 
If you would have met me then, you wouldn't have even known that I gave my life to the Lord. I was doing the th same things I used to do. I was gone. I was away from God for 17 years. And I came back about 20 years ago. I cannot believe that he still uses me. Wow. I can't believe it. Like, listen, I, I look at, I, I'm the last person that should be up here. If you, if you met some of my buddies previously, they'd be like, he's a pastor, what? God will still use us. If all we have to do is remember and come back, and God will still use you. So that's what I believe the Lord is telling us this morning. It's never too late. Listen, you have not strayed too far. You haven't done it this time. Ever heard that one? Well, I've done it this time. You're like, you don't, for, like, bro, you don't know what I've done. God does, and he wants to use you. See, God is, is warning us of this because I believe that he has some really great things that he wants to do within not only this church, Calvary Chapel Trustful, but through Calvary Chapel Smoky Mountains and all the other churches, Bible-believing churches all around the world. And I believe he wants to do something great this year in the church. Listen, we live in dark times. We know that. And the darker the society gets, the lighter we should burn. See, it's not that we're all a bunch of backsliders. But because in our society and culture, it's easy. Listen, it's easy for a good Christian to veer off. To leave that love while not even realizing it until the Lord lets us know that, that it's happened. So this might be a wake-up call for some that are thinking, this is exactly where I've been. Listen, when I came back to the Lord, I had been away for 17 years. I didn't hardly go into a church because I didn't want to, I felt like if I went in, I'd be judged. But I finally went into a church and the pastor was speaking on Nehemiah and he has us turn to this passage at the end of the service. And he teaches on this passage for about 10 minutes and it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit just convicted me right where I was. And I was like, wow, that's where I'm at. I, I remember those days. I remember that Lord. And it just drew me back. It, it drove me back to Jesus and I've been the same since. Perhaps that's you. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I've been, I've been so caught up with what's going on in the world that that's what consumes my thoughts. That's what consumes my feeling. And that's where my, my feet are pointed, is at those things. Maybe that's you. See, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's easy to see what a person is consumed with by listening to what they speak about. Wherever our feet are pointed at, that's where our attention and affection will be, wherever we're pointed. It's hard to see what's behind you when you're looking forward, isn't it? The Lord is saying it's time. Maybe he's saying this to you individually. It's time. It's time. It's time to get our feet pointed back at Jesus. It's time to get our feet pointed back at Jesus. And, and what a time to do it. January 21st, 2024. Wow, what a great time. Let's make it 2024 a year of intimacy with Jesus. Because listen, intimacy with Jesus, what does it do? It changes everything. Intimacy with Jesus literally changes everything. And listen, I know it has in my life. I know it does in my life. It continues to do in my life. And I have to be reminded, listen, this is not, it's not just that I'm up here preaching this to you guys, but listen, I'm preaching to myself here because there's times where I get off track, I veer off and, and I lose that intimacy. I, man, I want intimacy with Jesus this year. I, wanna, I want 2024 to be like that year I got saved, where I'm out sharing, where I have a love for people. Yes, we'll do ministry, and we're going to do great things. But man, we, we've got to focus on our relationship with Jesus first and foremost. That's where I want to be.